guys have any questions about anything to get started. Everyone's good with the midterm? That's good. Started. So, we'll do a review today. Um, Three thirty. This room. Um, the last time. And you get a couple of results. Is that if I take that field, then polynomials in one variable of graph, coefficients in F. This is what's known as a PID. It means all ideals are principal. All ideals are, which means all ideals are generated by one. It's just a single element of the form f of x times other elements, some polynomial f. That was last time. Of course, same is true for integers. So also, integers. Um, and that follows from just the fact that we've classified the subgroups, right, of C. We've classified all the subgroups. They're just generated by a single element. So we had that n times subgroup. And it's easy to see that this is an ideal. So ideals have to be subgroups. So it's the only possible. Now, there's a proposition part, um, that basically details, uh, well, there are a couple of propositions, but one is that uh, there's a notion of GCD. So let me, and this follows from this first fact. I'm just going to state this. Corollary to one. Um, the first define, or the corollary will define something. The greatest common divisor of two polynomials, they're both in a, in a P. So H of X, if. Uh, when we take these two ideals and we sum them up, in other words, we take all element, any element, what the first ideal added to any element, the second ideal. But we get, well, this is an ideal, as can easily be checked. Since all ideals are principal, we have some H, monic H, which this is. We do want to insist that H. Remember, monic means the leading order coefficient is one. All of this, by the way, this is in X.
let's define GCD this way. This is sort of how we defined it for integers back in the day. Um, and then we have these results, which may look familiar. Uh, okay, so the first is that, this is what I, is the definition. R of H of X. Sorry, I'm just gonna write this way. First is what I just wrote. Again, go down first. Second is that H of X is a polynomial that divides both F of X and G of X. There's a pivot. Divides X of X. Um, second is that if some other polynomial, K of X, divides both of these, then it divides, K of X divides H of X. And then the last bit, Look a little familiar to you. There are two polynomials, p of x and q of x. x. What's that? p of x times h of it, uh, sorry, times f of x plus q of x, q of x. Plus What does that look like? Okay, what it's called with that. Phase yeah. So these, all of these, I, I'm not going to prove this because we already proved it. We just did it for integers. And the point is, is that once you know things are a PID, the same proof, Exact same proof, but just replacing the integers with the polynomials applies. The logic is exactly the same. And so you can get all of these results for other ones. And this is, again, this for trying to illustrate the power of algebra that you can, a lot of these uh, reasonings, these proofs, really are structurally talking about things about the, the, the ring itself. Yeah. 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 What? Monic? Monic means that the, so that's not so important uh, for this, for any of these results, they're all still true. It's there to make sure that H is uniquely defined. But what it means, it means the leading coefficient is uh, one. So that means that if, you know, like X cubed plus one, this is monic, but two X cubed plus one is not. So monic, monic just makes uniqueness, <coughs> gives us uniqueness so that we can say something like this without an ambiguity. Because we can certainly multiply this guy by some non-zero constant and it's still, this equation is still true. So yeah. Okay, nice corollary. Again, I won't, I won't bother you with the proof of this. Um, I'd rather just kind of uh, move on about okay. all right so i started today talking about these pids and of course pid one of the, the middle word there is ideal right and so what's the big deal with ideals um well, ideals are really uh, quite important in algebra and algebraic geometry and anything that's really tied up in, in algebra, uh, ideals make their appearance. So what, why is that? Well, one big reason is because they, they're kernels of ring homomorphisms. And 
brain homomorphisms are, are quite important. So another big reason is that we can take an ideal and just like with groups, if we have a normal subgroup, we can quotient. So this is kind of the content of this next theorem. This is in, I guess, uh, 11.4, a section for this week, um, is that we can push in rings. And unlike, however, unlike groups, you don't really, again, you really don't want to think of ideals as being sub rings. I mean, technically they are if you forget about the unit, um, but you don't want to think of them that They're not, that's not the right perspective. But they're the subsets that allow you to push. Let's talk about that theorem, and then I'll talk about some examples. Question? What's a DID again? Okay, so good question. Actually, didn't define one of these. So a PID is a principal ideal domain. stands for but it means there's two two things in here one is that it's a that every ideal is principal meaning and if i have an ideal inside of it it looks like if i have an ideal in r then r this ideal is equal to the principle the sum a, the sum element it's just multiples of sum element The other part is domain, and domain I didn't define, but let me define it now. It just says there are no zero divisors. It says that if A times B equals zero, then either A is zero or B is zero. Yeah. So those parentheses around A just mean multiples of A? Yeah, this is the notation for principal ideal. Last time. So this A is a principal ideal. This is all multiples of A. Let's say we're in a commutative ring. This otherwise is a left ideal. Okay. All multiples of A. That's an ideal. If you add the distributive property says if I add two of these, it's still a multiple, right? R of A plus S of A. This is equal to R plus S times A. I add two, it's closed under addition, closed under negation. And of course, if I multiply on the left by some other element, it's still in there. So that's, those are the conditions to be an ideal. So and you might have a hard time imagining an ideal that's not a principal ideal, uh, but that's like, there are a lot. <laughs> Being a principal ideal of domain is very special. It's like those are the delicate flowers of free theory. <laughs> Especially. Okay. Questions? More questions? Yeah, I mean, I have this tendency, I'll just keep going, right? I'll just get, I'll just. Keep on diving deeper. So if you if I'm losing people, they need to raise their hand. You need to say, ask what what is this? You went too fast. So I'll do it. I'm happy to slow down. But I don't you can raise your hand. I don't know. Or you can just interrupt. It's okay. All right. So let's talk about quotient. Right. Let's let I be an ideal of the And there is a unique structure, this is a theorem, and there is a unique ring structure. On additive group, R over I. Um, such that
the group homomorphism. The additive group homomorphism is a ring homomorphism. Of course, this follows from the Next statement, which is Norton, follows from the fact that this is the group homomorphism, but we can say it anyway. Kernel by this idea. So let's take a second and see if we can digest. So we have this ideal in R. What is an ideal? It is an additive subgroup that satisfies this extra property that if I multiply elements in that additive subgroup by elements of R, they stay in that additive subgroup. That's, but at, at its base, like the, one of the basic conditions is that it's an additive subgroup. So R is an additive, additive group, and that uh, operation of addition is appealed means that this is a normal additive subgroup. Because if you have an abelian group, normality, every subgroup is a normal subgroup. So I can form the group quotient R over I. That's allowed. If you have a normal subgroup of a group, you can take the group quotient. So I do that here. But this is an additive group. But the point of this theorem is that I can also put a multiplication on it, making this into a ring. So when I consider this homomorphism of additive groups, it becomes a ring homomorphism. Make sense? You're sort of enhancing the structure of this additive group into a ring structure, giving it more structure than just the additive group structure. So that this is compatible questions. So the proof is just kind of you do what you have to do. So you kind of because you know pi is a homomorphism, or because you want pi to be a homomorphism, there's only one real way to define multiplication. Define multiplication. Let's say I have two cosets, a plus i and I'm multiplying B plus I, I'm going to define this to equal A times B plus I. So that's the definition. Yep. Are A and B elements of R? Yep. But these are cosets. So these are elements of the quotient. They're left, they're left cosets. I mean, addition, the operation is addition. Okay. So we're putting a plus. So they may not look like left cosets. They don't look like G times you know, H. Uh, but this is the operation of addition. Is. So then we have to, so the key, so associativity here shouldn't be hard. The unital condition shouldn't be hard. All of the things that you would expect Distributive property is not hard. All of these things follow immediately. The only thing you have to really check here is well defined to show that this is well defined. In other words, you need to say that, okay, when I do this, there is some ambiguity, right? The ambiguity is the choice of representatives, A and B. If I had chosen some other element in this coset, I can represent this as A tilde plus, plus I, B tilde. So let's say A tilde um, is an element of A plus R. B tilde is not. In other words, if I chose a different representative, I, I have to get the same thing. So, well, I get A tilde, B tilde. So we just need to show 
that a tilde that these two cosets are the same. We need to show that. Show that, then multiplication is well defined, and all the properties of multiplication are easily. So how do we show it? Well, if A, I mean, we have this. So we have A tilde is equal to A plus, call it X. Well, maybe not. let's call it R. A tilde equals, for some elements R and S of the ideal. Now let's take their product. A tilde, E tilde, this equals A plus R times A plus uh, B. B plus A, I mean, I would just use the distributive property plus RB plus AS plus RS. So here, uh, again, I'm saying ideal, I'm going to mean two, if it's non commutative, I mean two sided ideal. It's commuted. If, it, if it's non commuted when I'm talking left ideal, this is not true. So, two sided ideal is what I need for non commuted All right. But now you notice something. What about, what about this guy? Where is this? Yeah, it's an I, right? We have R is an I, so any multiple of R is an I. This is an I, this is an I. S is an I, so a multiple of S is an I, so that's an I. And I is a group under addition, so I can take their sum. So this whole thing is an I. We're good. But that implies that these, but that means that they're in the same coset, right? That means that. A tilde B tilde is an element of A B plus I. Uh, so, so A tilde B tilde plus I, that these are the same left coset. This is just another choice of representatives. How do you get representatives for a coset? You choose an element of that coset, say it's that times mm -hmm. the, the so. so this is the point here is that, and I'm just gonna say that's that's it. That's all we need to really show because everything else again follows just from this definition. Associativity follows, right? All of these properties follow just from that definition. You just need to make sure it actually makes sense. Again, if you didn't have an ideal, if you had a subgroup, if you had to try to define something else, it really wouldn't make sense. You wouldn't, you would have this, this would be where the trouble lies. You wouldn't be able to make sense out of this question. So ideal, this is why one of the other kind of main reasons why ideals uh, take such a uh, prominent role in algebra really. Try to explain that. Let's look at some examples. The first example are these principal ideals. So if we took something like 5z, this is a principal ideals. So then we can consider one way of understanding ideals thinking about their quotients. Of course, this is just C my 5Z, which is a field because 5 is prime. Take real polynomials and we can 
consider the following one. This is the principal ideal channel. Tell me what they think. Here's a perspective to have. What does it mean to quotient by the ideal? What it means is you take all of the things in the ideal and you set them equal to zero. You kill them all. In fact, if you look at Arden's book in the last part of this section, is this diagram where it's like kill, 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 kill. <laughs> Very violent looking mathematical behavior. But the idea is like you take everything in your ideal and you set it to zero. You just make it zero. So if you take that philosophy with this first example, I'm setting five to zero, right? All the things, all multiples of five become zero, which is kind of what you do when you mod out by five. You keep all of the arithmetic that you need, but you're going to set all multiples of five to zero. Now we're going to do the same thing here. We're going to take all polynomials, we're going to set x minus three to zero. If we set x minus three to zero, that means x should equal three. So we're just actually just fixing x at three. So we can think of this as evaluating all of our polynomials at three. And what are we left with? We're just left with all our real numbers, our values that we have of all possible polynomials. Indeed, this is just isomorphic to R. Yeah. So would we get that result for, I guess it might be isomorphic to C. Some cases, let's do it. Like, if we get that result with like any sort of polynomial we stuck under the like maybe quotient we could, hey, you're talking about hey, can I have a favorite like polynomial? <laughs> Say first or second order, that's crazy. Here, guys, <laughs> you talk later about it. What's up? Anyone have a favorite polynomial? Nobody has any favorite polynomial. Huh? X squared minus nine. X squared minus nine. Take that principle. So if we take R of X and quotient out by X squared minus nine, what do we get? It's kind of much harder problem, much harder. Okay, so that's true, right? So in a sense, you can think this is uh, this is fat. This is something you can factor. So x minus three times x plus. Three. The fact that you can factor it means something. Um, if you think about it, well. You can think of it this way. I can tell you what it's going to be. It's going to be like R, and then maybe you could say R plus R times X. So in other words, it's like a two-dimensional vector space. And you can think of this as, a, and you have this relation that R squared equals, or X squared equals nine. In other words, I square this element, I'll get back to here. That's one way of thinking about it. And usually we put a little plus here to they're sort of two separate spaces we're adding together. But another way of thinking about this, another, this is also isomorphic to R times R, where you just add each factor and you multiply each factor. So there is another way of thinking, and this is, this is something maybe, something called maybe the Chinese remainder theorem, which tells us that we can kind of split this up into two factors based on the fact that this is reducible. First factor you can think of in a sense as being like 
x minus 3, and the other factor being like x plus 3. Um, you know that if you multiply those two factors together, you should get 0. It's a question out by x squared. That was a hard one. I think an easier one, I was thinking everybody would be like, oh, come on. Of course, like x squared plus 1 is like the best one. Right. That. And this is addressing the question. I quotient this. This ideal. Yes, you're right. We get C. Yes. Um, This goes to what I was saying before, is that you can also do things like if you have, why are we so interested in polynomial ideals? If you had something like x squared minus two, but now we thought of this as an ideal not in R of x, but rather two of x. Now this is not, you can't factor this. If you want to factor this by x minus square root of two times x plus square root of two, right? That's a reasonable thing to do if your coefficients are real. Square root of two is, is not rational. So there's no way of factoring this in this ring. So if you actually quotient this ring by this ideal, you'll get q plus q times the square root of two. This is what I meant earlier when I said one of the reasons we study polynomial rings is because we can kind of enlarge our fields uh, by solving polynomial equations just by taking certain ideas. Very uh, standard practice and a lot of uh, field theory is based on studying this. Okay, guys. So there's a lot of examples. Uh, let me do one more, though. Although, let me say something first. Um, so, so, an ideal is maximal. Yeah, no question. This question has a couple of layers to it. Okay. So, first of all, is like R and then three times R, are those isomorphic to each other? Um, what is R? Like real numbers. Oh, capital R. Yeah. Yeah, real and three times R. Mm -hmm. um, they're the same set, right? Yeah, okay, so they're the same set. So then is that q plus q root 2 thing just the exact same expression as you wrote a little earlier with our r plus r times x? Yeah, x so this is, I'm so like okay. Is yeah. So so and that's why we get the r times x. So there's this this operation here is called direct sum, and it's it's something that you can do for if you have two abelian groups, you can just take what's called their direct sum. It looks a lot like the direct product, but it kind of behaves differently when you take it in linear direction. So and it's more complicated direct sums for these kinds of situations. What it means is it just like practically speaking, what is it? It's just pairs R and then like you know S and X. So like, this is what it would, these would be the elements of this. And then you would have an operation where you could take products, you would treat it like R plus SX. And then if you, you know, add two or, or multiply two, you would do the same thing, but then you add this relation X squared minus nine or equals nine. Right? So if you just consider like all expressions like this, but with this relation, and you add and multiply. Adding won't do anything. You know, you'll just add the coefficients. Multiplying, you get a factor of x squared. You turn it into nine. It goes into this part. That's so what. Yeah. In parentheses with the comma is the adding and the top one is multiplying. Yeah, I just I, maybe let me just say this. Okay, let me let me do a little more justice to this example. So. 
So let's look at this again. So what are elements and then how do we multiply? I'll use A and B instead of R. So an element of this will look like A plus BX. And if I have two elements, well, adding them is nothing new. You just add them like ordinary quantities. Multiplying though, how we multiply? Well, we use distributive properties, so we're going to get a one, a uh, a one, a two, and we'll get an a one uh, b one. I'm sorry, a one b two x plus a two b b one x, and then. Okay, so we also get a B1, B2, X squared, but X squared is nine, so you get plus nine times B1, B2. This is the expression multiplying. How we multiply. So we can take two expressions that look like this and multiply them and get another expression that looks like that. Um, and you can check that this is associative satisfies distributive property that everything works as you would expect. Does that help? Okay. And then this this is sort of the same thing, but of course I think it's a little more you know clear what to do here because the square root of two is you know when you square root of two. It's not like X or something. Questions? I was about to define um, an earth shattering concept for you guys. Kind of. So, an ideal R in here, my R, called M, R, called maximal. If R mod M. See what the connection is. So, a certain maximal ideals we've seen up here, some interesting maximal ideals. Uh, 5Z maximal, half supply this field. That's maximal, that's minus three. This is maximal. Um, is x squared minus sine maximum? I say x squared minus nine, I mean the principal ideal generated by x squared minus nine. Not <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. So let me let me draw your attention to something in this in this ring here, as I've described it, which you should expect, I think, but probably aren't. It's not on the top of your head because what happens if I do this? Well, I have basic distributive property in my ring, so I get nine minus x squared, right? x squared is nine, so it's equal to nine minus nine to zero. However, these are both non-zero. So I've got two elements, so when I take their product, I get zero, but they're non-zero elements. That's going to be a problem if I have this here, because I could certainly multiply the by the inverse of if it were here. But the other other than zero. So there are, a field does not have zero divisors. Is a way of putting it. The field is domain. So this is not uh, not maximum. It's an ideal, but not maximum.
Um, this, this, however, is maximal. It's the last one. Because this is actually a peak. Okay. So why am I talking? What does this have to do with anything? Well, uh, I'm going to skip this mapping property of quotient range. I really did that for the reading. Please do look through this section. But I do want to talk about the correspondence. Term 11. This is very important for at least what I do, uh, but for a lot of people, it's an easy geometry and algebra. So let's suppose we have a surjective ring of intervals. To remind you a little bit of something that we proved, very similar. Surjective ring homomorphism. And there's a correspondence, objective one to one. Objective correspondence, I'm going to say order preserving. Order, the order being inclusion, order of inclusion, preserving correspondence between two sets. First set, set of all the ideals. In R, containing the kernel. The other is all ideals in script R. And the correspondence is if I take an ideal in here. Um, I can pull it back, let's call it J. And consider all the elements mapping to J. So let's call it uh, the number is J. And if I have an ideal of I in here, I can map it to phi of I. This will be an ideal only in the setting where we have a surjective ring of numbers. Surjective here, this will be an ideal. So V invert, these are these were defined for groups, and it's the same definition. Okay. I'm gonna prove this. The proof is pretty much the same as the one for groups. Um, so you can look at that. But what it says, <clears throat> what it does is it gives us a, a rationale, well, at least it gives me a rationale for defining maximal ideals this way. What's so maximal about a maximal? So this is a, a, let me call it a proposition. So ideal M are maximum if and only if there's no I'll say it is not contained properly contained in a ideal. That's the idea of maximality. In other words, what does that mean? That means if M is actually contained in an ideal I. R, then M equals I. Another a less wordy way of saying. Well, this is a, I mean, that this makes sense in, a, in the sense of English. <laughs> this makes sense of maximum, right? We're saying that it's as big as it can get without being all of the ring. Um, 
but it, how does it make sense in, in this notion? And uh, the relationship there is to say, okay, well, if M is maximal, then we have this ring homomorphism R, R mod M to be a That's the definition of maximum that I gave. Um, and then we have the course, we just have this correspondence theorem that we, we wrote down here. It says that any, the only ideals here that contain M, this type, are ones that come from ideals of this field. Go back to here. A field has two ideals, zero and all of the field. And their inverses are M, The correspondence theorem says, okay, well, if this is a field, then M is maximal in this sense, and vice versa. Vice versa. If M is not maximal, then this won't be a field. There will be some ideal in here, and we can find something in between the maximal of this M. I spent the last five minutes talking about something um, that's really fantastic. And hopefully, it will be. Okay, so let, let me stick with our commutative. Uh, okay. Why? The rings. Well, as it turns out, if you're interested in space, let's say you have a model and you're interested, you, you find that you have some algebraic constraints, right? So this happens quite a bit in modeling. It's you, you, you don't, you have some large space of variables, but you find out, okay, well, the only interesting things are happening on some solution to some equation. Well, then you, you may want to consider functions on that space for solution. And so our commutative ring, our commutative rings could be thought of as functions on spaces. So if I have a space, I can certainly talk about the space of the ring of functions on this. Now, what's this doesn't necessarily answer at all why such a ring. However, there is a way of reversing this process too, which is to say, in fact, if I have a ring, I can define a space. And that space is equal to sense the, the set of maximal ideals. Those are the points of that space. In a, how, how do we, let's give an example. Let's say you're talking about the unit circle. The unit circle is described by an equation x squared plus y squared minus one, or equal to one. I can look at r of x, y. I can quotient out by that polynomial. This ring, is a ring of function of algebraic functions, of polynomial functions on the circle. But we can go ahead and get all of the points of that circle as well and understand the space from this ring, some to some degree, by just saying, okay, well, if I want to consider ring home, think of ring homomorphisms to R. All I have to do is choose a point in here. I'll get coordinates. If I evaluate them, I get a homomorphism. And kernel of that homomorphism will be unique. It will be dependent on that point. It will be a maximal idea. So I can take this ring and actually build the space from the algebra. 
And then what's, what's so interesting about this is now, let's say we take the world of brains, all commutative brains, and now we just learn more or less, more or less than more, how to build spaces. There's a relationship. I'm interested in sending my circle into a torus. I want the circle to kind of go around once. I'm interested in all kinds of maps from my circle to my torus. So I have functions here, continuous functions. As it turns out, those functions in the algebraic world come from ring homomorphism. So this is like a real short summary of one of the key subjects of mathematics right now and has been for the last hundred years. This is algebraic geometry. So we take, we study spaces, basically defined by a bunch of algebraic constraints through their rings. And we're able to understand maps between those spaces and relationships between those spaces by studying the algebraic structure of the rings. We get very far with this study. So yeah, let me just stop there. I mean, I'd love, maybe next time I'll show you a few of the very simple examples of this that show you how many wonderful and interesting spaces you can get. Right.